question is, who's the one? Not just for Easter, but in general. Who's the one? Who's the family member, the coworker, the neighbor that God is laying on your heart to pray for, share your faith with? Easter is a natural good day to just invite someone to church. People kind of expect it. Let's, we'll fill it up, I'm sure, multiple times. Good Friday is a gr- one of my favorite services of the year. So be involved in Easter. And then next week, we have, in my opinion, one of the finest preachers, I'm telling you. Peter Reeves can bring the word in an incredible way. I know it's you lose an hour of sleep, I think, next week. But for the 11 o'clock crowd, I mean, that should be, Right? And we're still up in time to make it to church, so be here next week. So let's jump into this today. I uh, have enjoyed doing this series on Ephesians today. Maybe, you know, we, we kind of started building last week. Um, you know, I love having fun in church. I'm for that. I think we should have fun. We should laugh. We should. Today's message might be a little less of that, more just let's, we're going to dig into some things that might be hard for you to hear Maybe you haven't been raised in this kind of tradition or you're going to maybe hear some things. I would challenge you, all the notes, um, all of them this week, I put them all in there. So if you want to follow along, go back. It's a good way to follow. Because I do, so I'm going to skip some notes. It's just, I have more notes than time. Although in this service, we don't have anywhere to go. Thank you for saying yeah. One yeah, I got you. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter six. Could you do me a favor one more time? Could you stand for the reading of the word? We love to honor the word here at New Life. Paul's been writing some really great, strong things. This is the same three verses we used last week. So here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power and put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against Um, the devil schemes. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the, when, not if, not you might face a day of evil, when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, and then it goes on to say stand with, and then we're going to, after Easter, we're going to go through every piece of the armor So we're building to something here, right? So it's not just like, good luck, the devil's real. He wants to destroy your life. Now go pray about it. We're going to work on some things. So thank you. Let's pray today. God, we thank you as we dig into some things that maybe is new to some of us, or some of us, we're way beyond what we're going to talk about today in this. Let us have ears to hear. Let us have a sensitive heart. And God, as your spirit speak to us, let us take it in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isn't God's word incredible? You can be seated. Don't you love the word today? Come on. When we start talking about two things today, things can get kind of like weird, right? We're going to talk about demonic possession, and we're going to talk about demonic oppression. Some of you are like, oh boy, you're one of those churches. Well, I have had the privilege... Really, it's an honor of traveling literally the world, sharing the good news of Jesus from Africa to Asia, um, Europe, South America, Central America. I'll be in Cuba in May, probably Thailand this year. So there's some things, or Vietnam, right? One of those two. I was said today, I think the only reason they asked me because they know I'm the only one that'll sit on a plane for 20 hours to go share the good news of Jesus. Those flights are brutal, but um, we do it. I love it. And because we, when you're exposed to some things, especially in second and third world countries, you see some things that you, you'll never deny the reality that there is an enemy that is real. By the way, that stuff has happened right here at New Life too. So before you're like, oh, oh it has. So um, I'll never forget. I've shared this probably once or twice before. We were in one of our trips to Haiti. And I was preaching with an interpreter. I don't speak Creole. I know you're shocked. You're like, God. Right? You're probably like, oh, I thought you spoke every language. I don't. And uh, I was preaching, and I really just felt like the Holy Spirit would say, and today, the power of God is real, and he wants to set you free from the power of the enemy. And this place is packed. A lot of you, we had like 40 teenagers and youth with me on this trip. And I'm like preaching, and there's like, two or three teenage girls in a row, and the rows are long wooden benches, and they're full. And right when the interpreter says it, 
these young teenage malnourished girls start foaming at the mouth. They're growling. They're screaming. They literally turn. There's a bench full of people, grown-ups, and these girls grab this bench. Literally, people are going. Jackson was there with me. I do want to give say this. Today, Jackson is, is today's Jackson's 24th birthday, and uh, I started with this story with that. One of the things I've been blessed to do is, as a family, we take our kids and expose them to things like other places around the world to see. Not, not so though. A lot of times they're going, oh, I'm just so thankful for America. I want you to be thankful for America. I want you to see everyone needs Jesus, right? Let's just build into that selfishness some more. But we are doing a trip to El Salvador this summer. It's a great way to go with your kids and do stuff. So Jackson was there. He will remember this. And, uh, as, so they, and then there's these big pots. These, they're literally have, um, they have dirt in them and plants. And one of these girls picks it up like nothing, slams it to the ground, they're trying to subdue her. And all of a sudden, the pastor walks up to me and he's like, man of God, set them free. And I was like, oh, I'm just a guest here. I don't want to. I'm going to go to your home and get in your fridge. Like, and I realized in that moment, it was like, it was my responsibility as the man of God in the house. And I just followed biblical scripture. I didn't like, you know, go through a long drawn out process. I took authority in the name of Jesus it called out the demons, and you, you can't imagine the change. And the next night, the first three girls, hands raised in worship, lifting up Jesus were these girls. But here's what's interesting. Uh, we had a small group of that, of some of those kids where maybe they're from a different, maybe denominational background, which I do hate denominations. Not the people, but just the whole, ugh, it's gross. And... Um, like, you don't, I don't agree with something in the Bible, so I'll go start my own church. You don't agree with that? You go start your church. We'll all start our own churches. But then those cultures, there's like one church per community, which is, I love that. And, um, but some of the girls were raised different, so I look over, and I'm not even joking. I don't say this so you'll laugh. I look over, and a girl has her hands in her ears, and she's, she's this isn't real. This isn't real. My pastor said, this isn't real. He told me, he's saying that before I came, if we see this, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. And then by like the fifth time, she comes to me and goes, I kind of think this probably is real, isn't it? And I go, yeah, it is. We serve a, a real adversary, and, he's, and, and he would love nothing more than to destroy your life. So let's look at this today. Let's first talk out by just taking a short look at the idea of demon possession. By the way, Jesus says one of the realities of apostles is we should, disciples, we should be seeing people set free with our prayers. It might not always be foaming at the mouth, like, right? but it could be, you have people around you that are bound by sin, and God can use your story and your testimony to see people set free. We are hope dealers at this church. We are sharing the gospel and the good news of Jesus. The term possession implies ownership. You own or you possess your car or home. The Bible teaches us that believers, followers of Jesus become children of God. We become a child of God with the Holy Spirit in us. How does a person become demon-possessed? It's if you like or belong to things of Satan. When demons are not opposed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, the term oppressed means to be kept down by severe and unjust use of, of fear or authority. This type of torment can come from inside of us, we talked about it last week, or these outside from spirits um, by putting thoughts in our mind that drive us away from the truth of the blessings of God. Most spiritual oppression is a starts with the thought process that turns into actions. You show me someone that has a poor spiritual thought life, and I'll show you someone that is struggling against the enemy in their walk with the Lord. Oppression seems to be, and if I'm going to be really honest, this is, this is just my, my observations. Oppression seems to be running rampant in the body of Christ. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines oppression as to crush or to burden or to burden by abuse of power or authority. What does that mean? Satan has no power in your life unless you allow it. 
or to burden spiritually or mentally, to weigh upon you heavily. This method that the devil has has been most successful in defeating believers today. The enemy wants to weigh you down, to burden you with the cares of this world. He wants you to lose sleep over your children's well-being. He wants you to be depressed about your life and your marriage. He wants to crush your walk with the Lord. And the question today is, will you allow him to continue to ravish your relationship with him? Hear me, I don't think anyone in this room is like, you know what I want to do? I want to give the enemy a place in my life. You know what I want to do? I want to not be able to sleep at night. I want to have poor mental health. I want to slander and gossip about people around me. I would just want to be, I just want, I want all the smoke. Come on, devil, bring it. I got it. No one sets out to do that. Most of the time, it's a slow fade. And can I tell you, a lot of times it starts with compromising certain areas of your life. When you let your guard down in an area of your life, you are opening yourself up for an attack from the enemy. And this is not just some made up fairy tales that a pastor is telling today. This is the reality of the world we live in. This definition says oppression is an abuse of power or authority. So who gives the devil the authority to come in and beat us down? This may not be the answer you're looking for, but it's not your mom. It's not your dad. It's not the way you were raised or the fact that you were an orphan. It's not because your mom left you for dead or the fact that your marriage was torn apart. It's not the abuse from your past. The only person who can empower the enemy is you. I want to say this. I'm not unempathetic or unsympathetic for what you face in your life. You know me. Those you go, I'm not that pastor. Just get over it. Well, that's... That is not even a biblical idea of getting over it. The idea is turning it over to Christ and allowing him to heal you. Some people are healed instantaneous, and some people, it takes generations. Right? Like you're going to start a healing, and then your kids are going to experience that healing even deeper. But it's all I know is this. Satan can take no ground he is not given. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He can't make anything. He can't speak anything into existence. He can only take ground that he is given. Are you ready to stop giving him ground today? Are you ready to walk in healing today? Are you ready to encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit like never before? The Bible says in Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Whether knowingly or merely because you were never taught on it, you are the one who opens the door when the devil knocks. You are the one who allows the enemy to come in and make a home. That's hard to hear. It's hard to hear. I, I, I think a lot of times when we talk about things like this, we go like to two extremes. You have your people who are like the devil, everything's the devil right? The devil's everywhere. Demons are just, they're everywhere when you're everything. And I I, I think sometimes we give, we blame the devil for our own mistakes. Sometimes I think the devil's like, I didn't even have to tempt you on that one. You, 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 You figured that out. But I also think there's another dangerous side, and that is none of this is real. This isn't like all this stuff with the occult and all this demonic stuff. It's just on movies, but telling you it's real and it is as real as you are sitting here today. The enemy wants to destroy your life. And the major question today is what steps are you going to take to make sure your surrender to Jesus outweighs the thoughts and the attacks of the enemy? Because hundred percent is a choice. Again, no one in this place is like, I want to be oppressed. I want to not be able to sleep. I want to be miserable. But it won't go anywhere until you take spiritual authority and tell it to go. Spiritual authority is not based off of your authority anyway. That's why it's called spiritual authority, not your authority. When you became a relationship with Jesus, God gave you a couple things. And one of those is God, it's an accounting attorney, imputed. That means he gave it to you and you didn't deserve it. 
When Jesus died on the cross and he conquered death, hell, and the grave, when you follow him, you have a certain amount of spiritual authority that has been given to you from the very throne of heaven. That's why the Bible says when we resist the devil, he flees, right? You have authority to tell the enemy no. You have, Paul says, I take daily, I take captive my thoughts. This is a journey. This is a lifetime of learning. But notice what Jesus says. Now, this is Jesus talking in Luke chapter 10. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I have given you the authority to trample snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. And here's how you got some crazy people. Some people read this and read other places. Well, that means as Christians, we can like play with snakes and drink poison. And if, ever, if somebody invites you to one of those churches, check your friendship. Because if we start, we, we kill snakes, right? We don't, we don't play with them. I don't kill them. I'm not afraid of snakes, but... I'm actually not. I like I scare my family all the time. But, um, but right, this is a spiritual thing. You notice this, because it goes on to say, and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. Well, it's not talking about physical harm, because all of us are going to face things in our life that seem harmful. All of us in this room are going to have things happen that we don't really appreciate. This is talking about a spiritual harm. The enemy, right? Snakes and scorpions represents attacks of the enemy. They cannot overcome you. They cannot overcome you. Why? Because if you will walk in your God-given authority, when you know something is off, you can trust the Spirit and know, this is not for me. This is not for my family. This thought is not from the Holy Spirit. By the way, it can even be true, and you still don't have to believe the lie. The enemy brings back some truths about my life. He's really good about reminding me of some things. But that's not what God would have for you. Romans 8 says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even, in your, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Twice it says, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and you can have eternal life because the Spirit lives in you. Hear me today. A heart fully surrendered has everything you need to stand up to the attacks of the enemy. But I promise you today, your areas of weakness or where the enemy will attack you the most. Right there, like he's gonna tempt me different than he tempts you. Like there are some things in my life I don't struggle with that you might. And there are some things you don't struggle with that I do. But the enemy does know what's going on. We have to be careful. Are you taking your spiritual authority in life? The Bible is clear that the existence of demons numerous times in both the Old and New Testament. In addition, the Bible speaks about the influence that demons can have in the lives of humans. Some have tried to confine the work of demons in the lives of humanity to this idea of demon possession. A lot of times you're like, well, this isn't like the exorcist. Right? This isn't Rosemary's baby here. So I'm not like, my head's not spinning. Right? I'm not like speaking another language with like this, my voice doesn't change because the enemy... And because of that, we feel like, well, I must be good. I, I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm not like manifesting evil spirits. But see, there's more to it than this. And the Bible gives us great examples of this. And this idea of demon possession is it's actually, I believe, further propagated by a kind of a poor English transition or translation of the Greek New Testament word possession. I'm not going to give you a deep class here. But the idea of this word has different meanings. And the fact that the actual Greek term describes demonic presence in the life of a person, which really, instead of possess, the real word there should be demonized. 
Why does that matter? In other words, Scripture in no way limits the work of demonic powers to only that in pertain to movies like The Exorcist, where a person is completely held hostage by a demon so much that he or she cannot function. For all practical purposes, they cease to exist on their own person. Instead, the Bible in various places speaks of a person having an unclean spirit that negatively influences or affects his or her life in some way, either major or minor. Let me show you. In Mark chapter 5 and Mark, Luke chapter 8, Jesus is confronted with a demon, right? And he asked him, what is your name? Do you know what he says, what the name of the demon was? Legion. Again, I'm working on a message. I, should, I did this in the first one. I shouldn't do it in the second service. I'm not, it's not fully worked through. So if you're like, that sounds ridiculous. It's, I'm, it's a work in progress. I was thinking about like the authority that Jesus has over the world in governments. Now, listen to this. A Roman group of soldiers is known as a legion. Jesus here in front of the Roman Empire, literally the only time he ever, ever asked a demon to give him his name, and the name of that demon is Legion. I believe it's the, 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 uh, the apostles thought Jesus was going to come and overthrow a government. He was saying, I never came to overthrow a government. I came to overthrow a system that is set up against me, and no legion. There's no amount of demons in a government or a world system that can stand against me. So I'm working on that, so just be listening. In probably five or six years, I'll have that one ready. Right? So that's full-blown demon. That's demonization that has progressed all the way to the point of being fully owned by the enemy. But in Acts chapter 5, we see a little different thing. Ananias and Sapphira, the Bible says, have their hearts filled by Satan. They weren't acting out as demoniacs. They were stealing and they were lying about it. See the I wouldn't say that they were fully demon-possessed, but because of decisions in their life, they have given the enemy a foothold in their life, and because of that, they had to answer for that. In these two stories, we see the difference. There can be this idea of full-blown possession or oppression, but we need to deal with both of them. Scripture also speaks of different things. Demons being able to cause sickness or other physical affirmities, supply a clairvoyancy or fortune telling. They can exert great strength and become violent towards others. All these, I got scripture references in the notes for all of these. And they can bring physical harm to the so-called host. But while the Bible is clear that demonization is real, I got good news for you today. You're like, this seems hopeless. Like there's demons everywhere. When I let the, de is he gonna, am I gonna be demon possessed today? And how do I even know if I'm demon possessed? I got great news for you today. While the Bible is clear that this is real, it's also unmistakable communicates the truth of this, that God is sovereign over demons and that Jesus possesses full authority over the enemy. You don't need to live in fear. You need to live in faith. By the way, fear is a spirit, according to Paul writing to Timothy. You want to know a major um, sign that you are struggling with demon oppression is if fear just overwhelms you. Because the Bible said, God, for the God did not give you spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sign mind. Notice he calls it a spirit of fear. I'm not talking about, oh, I'm afraid of the dark or I'm afraid of a stake. I'm talking about, I am, I have an unrational fear that my kid's going to die. I'm going to get cancer. I'm going to, right? That, that's a spiritual battle. And those are battles you need to fight against. Because that is not from God. The gospel show that Jesus' ministry while he was on earth, he was conquering the powers of darkness in a very public way. What does that mean? Jesus fought public battles so that you could win private battles. Jesus fought publicly what you can't so that you can win in private. The Bible says that Jesus made a spectacle of Satan. He had to call him out in a public sense so that you don't have to lose privately. See, our private lives are a major, are a lot more of an indication of how we live than our public proclamations. The crowds were amazed. Watch this. In Mark 1, the people were so amazed, they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? 
and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. This fact leads to some important truths that we need to understand today. We should always keep at the forefront of our minds that when this idea comes up, we should understand first his position and his victory over the enemy. Colossians 2 says, when you were dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, aren't you thankful for this? God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all your sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness. In other words, your sin deserves judgment and the cross says mercy. Isn't that good? Which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away. I love this. Nailing it to the cross. This wasn't just some arbitrary cross. This was the cross of our Savior. That he took your sin, your condemnation. The enemy will try to condemn you. How do you know the difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation will tell you what you aren't. And conviction will show you what you can be. Because I've struggled. Anybody else struggle with condemnation? What a failure. What if they really knew what you're all about? Right? I've had people tell me that, like, oh, I believe you as a pastor, you're fake, and God's going to expose you. I'm like, man, that's hurt. That's very hurtful. Like, like, why would you say that? Like, why not just say I'm praying for you, right? Like, but people do that stuff, right? But you know, got to be careful. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but and having disarmed, this is good. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, this is good. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Ephesians 1 is a comparable great power for us who believe the power, the, that, that same power is at the same mighty strength that exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above the rule and authority, the power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also one to come. And God places all things under his feet and then pointed him head over everything for the church, which is the body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Remember this, Jesus is seated above all demonic powers and fully destroyed the work of the Satan. I believe we should know the schemes of the enemy, but the best way to know the schemes of the enemy is to understand God's plan the best. I love this analogy. I use it way too much. I'm like, I know where you're going with this. You use this too much, but it works. I know someone, their daughter worked at a high-end fashion store in New York, and she was over purses. So she, they, people would come in and try to trade, like, trade in like all these expensive handbags. I don't know, my wife, we get her bags at like Walmart and Target. Thanks for that, babe. And, um, but, but so they're like, so I asked her, like, how, do they, how do they recognize what's fake? Well, they don't. They study the real thing so much that when anything is off, they know that's not real. That's not reality. A lot of people spend so much time studying the devil that we lose sight of. We should be spending our time studying the word of God because here's why. The more I'm in tune with him, I'll have the moments where I'm like, something is not right about that. That situation isn't good. Like, I, I, uh, that relationship. Uh, uh. Now, I have to check my emotions sometimes. Because sometimes I, 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 I don't just don't like someone or I don't like a decision they made, so I've determined God's not using them. That's sinful too. So I have to make sure it's of God, not my emotions. But we can, our emotions are not a bad thing. Your feelings are not a bad thing. If they're surrendered to him. If they're surrendered to him. First John, it says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is righteous, just as he is righteous, the one who does what is sinful is the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So those, those works of the enemy are totally Satan's nature. So we must stand firm in his tactics. We're going to switch a little bit here. 1 Peter 5 says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. I love this. We can resist and stand firm, but we also, we need to do this together. 
Notice it says this. You know there's a family of believers throughout the world. I, I saw this reason. I love this. And it said this. Find friends that pray for you behind your back. I got enough people to talk about behind my back. I said, I'm so used to it. It literally, I, sadly enough, it doesn't even phase me anymore. When I pray about it, like, God, what are you trying to teach me? What can I learn? But I'm just so used to people talking bad about me in the church. Sadly enough, I'm just like, just get in line, right? Just here's the list. Right? What, what do you not like about the worship? This pastor, this person, this, get in line. And I pray about it all the time. Like, that's not a snarky comment. I spend hours a week praying, God, I want to just be led by you. Like, I don't want to be led. Like, that's what I want. So, but, but a lot of times the problem we run into is instead of praying for each other and believing with each other, we tear each other down. And that is just, that is, a, that is one of the major attacks of the enemy. But not only is Christ seated above all the demonic realm, indicating his authority over them, but so are believers. Ephesians 2 talks, I'm, I'm going to move fast here. You have a spiritual authority, right, that God has given you, right? It, 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 and it's Christ who provides the authority. We talked about this. Christian needs to understand, we need to understand that there is protection in him. Paul tells us, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Can I just get real practical here for a minute? I need one more yes. I'm not going to start. He's like, dude, come on, man. We got stuff to do today. Um, you ready for this? I've noticed something that bothers me and it's very ungodly. Christians, we do not manifest anything to happen. This is a big thing in culture right now. I, after the Super Bowl, right? I noticed some of our Chiefs players, I've manifested this to happen. I've heard famous athletes. I've heard Travis Kelsey's girlfriend talk about this. I've, I've heard, like, this is such a big thing in culture right now. Like, somehow you have the power. And if you don't know what's going on, I bet your kids are. This is a big thing in culture right now. We ma I manifested that to happen. You, you spoke the world into me? You, you, you said let there be light and there was light? You have the power in your positive thinking to make something happen. That's very ungodly. And matter of fact, it's very new age. We need to not. Also, we send prayers, not good vibes. I get it. It's not, I'm not being snarky. If you say sending you good vibes, I know what you mean. But I do think words matter. And we need to understand that I, I send prayers, man. I'm believing with you. I, I don't want to send you vibes, this arbitrary feeling of this. No, we pray for each other. Like we, 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 don't, we don't do that. Here's another one. This one gets me in trouble. I've shared this before. But our culture of self-care has turned into full-blown selfishness. Like, it, we are all about our, it's like crazy. Like, I'm like, everyone is so concerned about how, how you feel and about your, but can, can, everybody in the room, let me, let's be honest. You're going to have some good days and you're going to have some tough days and you're going to have some hard seasons and you're going to have some great seasons. But in those hard seasons, we don't need to run that and try to, the world's falling. No, you serve a great God that loves you so much and he cares about you. In our desire to have good self-esteem, we've found our esteem in ourself and not in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not, I, we are teenagers now in America. I read an article this week. There are more teenagers today on antidepressant medicine than any generation combined. combined. Maybe this idea is, if we're doing this, is maybe not the way it was meant to be. By the way, young people in the house, you're going to hate me for this, but I, I say it too much. I think one of the reasons, I don't think one of the reasons why I know is because we do, we, we're finding our value in things that just aren't of God. Amen. Everybody in the room, um, who didn't have a cell phone until you were out of high school? Raise your hand. Okay, let me say who didn't have a cell phone with the internet until after high school? You raise your hand, Derek. I was like, yeah, you might have had a cell phone, like a Zach Morris cell phone, you know? It's like taking my shoe off, right? Um, it's all right, because I'm saved by the bell. 
right? You guys know what I'm talking about here? Um, yes, thank you, right? Zach Morris, Screech, all the gang. Um, but here's the thing. I, the amount of things that I got into without the internet and social media, so you'll never hear me judging a generation of young people. We need to pray for them. They are facing things that we never faced. I think about, um, I also think about this, this, and they have been, it's been perpetrated on our kids, this sexuality movement. I am not here to come down on anyone. That's not, I'm not that pastor. But I do think a lot of the, the LGBTQ is, is not about a person sexual. It's about trying to promote a different sexuality than God already established what it is. Yeah. Again, like don't, let's not clap when you'll be mean to people. And we're not, I'm, I, everyone, everyone there deserves Jesus every bit as much as I do. And I'll love anyone, no matter what their sexual orientation is. I, I want everyone to come to know Jesus. But if my sexual orientation becomes my identity outside of him, we got a problem. God determined what sexuality is way before I ever had a vote. And I'm not going to apologize for what the Bible says or say, I wish it didn't say that. God's plan is perfect and he must know what he's doing. But I also think about this sexual agenda that is promoted on our kids. And this sounds like a joke. It's not a joke. Like what I'm going to say is kind of funny, but it's not. I think about the things that I got into. Like if we wanted to look at pornography, I'm 47 years old. You had to find a friend that had a pervy dad that had him hidden back. That's not even a joke. I'm not even saying that. That's a fact, right? Like their dad, like they had an uncle, right? That stayed at their house and in this garage, he had Playboy magazines. But these poor kids, I actually, the attack on their young mind is not ready to see what they're exposed to. So what's the answer? I'm I'm the priest and and the head of my home. And if the enemy is going to come in and and they're going to see things I can't control everywhere, but I can control what's in my house and I can control what my kids are involved in. So my kids, my haven for this, I love my kids. I think I have the best kids in the world, but they'll tell you we are old fashioned in the Blancet household. Like you don't just go walking off with your cell phones. You're not watching Netflix without us or you're not just going to go on YouTube because I'm going to be held responsible for that. And their young minds are not ready for the attack of the demonic things that are out there in the world. We need to be careful with this stuff. I, I love this movement going on. Be careful about where you let your kids stay the night. I've been a pastor 24 years. I can't tell you how many young people I've counseled that they go to a friend's house and it's other dad or an uncle or a big brother. Things happen that don't get taken back. So, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. I just, I believe in this stuff. Um, so finally this. Another thing that I see, two things that I see as a pastor that I see destroying people's lives. Number one is false teaching. And number two, bitterness. The age of the internet has caused people, they, we can go find a preacher on YouTube in 10 seconds. And then you get confused. I feel, I don't know what I believe anymore because I heard this pastor say this. I'm like, be careful. By the way, even if I say it, don't just believe it unless the word says it. Please. I'm a human. I've probably said things before. You're going to be shocked by this that even I would say, well, that is not what I meant to say. So don't make any assumptions. Don't build your theology on this guy's word. Build your theology on this man's word. With that being said, let me finish. (laughs) I do think in Ephesians 4, it says, I don't think I know this. Now we're going to read the Bible. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. And in your anger, do not sin. And do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Let me be honest with you. I know people, I don't like have anyone in mind, but I have watched this over years and years of ministry. The soil of bitterness is a heart that harbors hostility and does not deal with hurt by the grace of God. 
When someone becomes bitter, the bitterness takes root in their heart and it grows deeper. And the world is full of people who have not dealt with old hurt and current hurt. I'm going to say something hard, and this is hard for some of you to hear because I take a major stand in my life against gossip and negativity. What is gossip? Gossip is talking about someone. I don't care if it's true, by the way. Talking about someone or a situation to someone that they can do nothing about. That's gossip. And the Bible says in Proverbs, God hates it. God lists in Ephesians 5, gossip and slander with murder and sexual morality. What do I do with people that only want to talk bad about other people? I'm going to be, this is, sounds rough. I mark them and I avoid them. I don't want to do dinner with them. I don't want to do life with them. I don't want them in my circle of influence because I'm not strong enough to handle that. And eventually I find myself engaging back in those conversations. And then I have walked into sin and this is a demonic attack of the enemy. Please today, if usually if someone comes to me, I'll say, have you went to them? And hey, do you want to go? We can go. Let's go talk to them. You don't need this mess in your life. This brain left to its own devices has enough trouble of its own to be worried about Nick's problems and your problems and your problems. Let me take on your problems. Let me fight your battle. I'll fight a spiritual battle with you, but I won't fight a spiritual battle with you against someone else. And if you're engaged in that, but Paul is talking to church folk here, not the world. I'm not talking when you go to your job and they do it. I'm talking about if you leave a church service or you're in a home or you're in a life group and the conversation starts talking bad about the church, another pastor, someone else in the church, that is a demonic attack from the enemy. We've got to stop giving into this stuff. And I'm not here to look down on anyone. You know why I know it's a problem? Because I've engaged in it way too many times. Bitterness you know, the old phrase, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Worship team, you guys can come back. It grows. It's poisonous. And it grows up to trouble you, corrupting you. And I just love you enough today to tell you that some of you are better than this. And God has a, such an incredible plan for your life. I've watched some of the most anointed people I've ever known eventually get so bitter at a church or God because they've made it about people and less about reaching people. Well, listen, this church is far from perfect. We make so many mistakes. You can, let's have real conversations. If we mess up, tell us. That, 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 you, you get that this is different than that, right? I'm not off limits. Anybody that's been around me, I'm one of the most laid back pastors you'll ever meet. Like You don't have to say we're perfect or not have issues. That, but you know, you know when it's gone too far. Am I right? Can we get an amen on that? So just let's all check ourselves today. And then finally, one more thing. We need to keep our lookout for things of the occult in our lives. Again, a lot of times there, there are spiritual things happening around us. And I found this article from NBC News. And it's a person that itself identifies as a witch writing it. And the person said, I am one of millions, one of millions of Americans who proudly, secretly are, are dabbling with practices of witchcraft. And they talked about like Wicca, you know, paganism, magic. Um, and there's a lot of things we could go through here. Sorcery, fortune telling. In 1990, there was a study done that estimated there were around 8,000 people that adhered to this. By 2008, over 342,000. By 2014, it had grown another 4%. And estimations say that of modern pagan worship, that most Amer people that identify, by 250, people, 2050, 2050, let's try this. I tried it every way just to get you off. By 2050, the number of Americans practicing what we would consider other religions, right, will grow by three to four times. The religion is about this. Tell me this doesn't describe our culture. 
witchcraft or paganism is a religion that is about individual in many ways. The author says you can do your own thing. It's not signing up to an institutional religion. It's not signing up at a set of actions or beliefs that you must adhere to. It's about doing it your way. This stuff is all around. Our kids are getting this stuff. And right, I promise you, they're seeing things that from TikTok to Instagram, right? There be reels or seeing things that are like pushing them. Yeah, I, I read a thing the other day that a high majority of high school students find their theology from TikTok. It's a fact, it's the reality. So why don't we as believers start redeeming things instead of being like, that's such a divisive tool that we need to start putting some good content on these things. We can run from it or redeem it. I remember when the internet came out, pastors were like, that's the mark of the beast. True story. Email. Any church, any guy that gets an email, you are setting yourself up for the mark of the beast. Church people are weird, right? But let's let God redeem these things. Because in Leviticus 20, Moses writes, I will set my face, speaking of God, against anyone who turns to mediums and spirit, um, spirit is to prostitute themselves by following them. And I will cut them off from other people. Parents, we have a big responsibility today. And you know the best way for your kids to walk in freedom? You walk in freedom. I had a parent come up to me recently and said, my kid doesn't want to come to church and I knew their story. And I'm like, well, how do you speak about the church when you're gone? Well, not very good, I go. No. I'm shocked your kids don't want to come to church and all they hear is negativity about church and they're not spiritual enough or we don't do this enough. Just be careful because I want my kids to love the house of God, but I want them to love Jesus more by my example than church anyway. But notice this. I want to say this. Parents are accountable for leading their children on the right path. It's a parent's duty to steer children away from evil by guiding them into the light of God's truth. Moses is writing He's teaching the children of Israel. They just come out of the wilderness and, and they're establishing this new commandment. And he's teaching them, what do we do with the love of God? How do we teach this? These commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home or when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as a symbol on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and gates. In other words, everywhere, everywhere I want my kids to know this family, we're about Jesus. This family, we're about loving people. This family, we're about the things of God. You can do it today. But some of us need to get real and we need to start dealing with some stuff in our life. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're thankful for you. God, let us realize we have a real enemy that is out to destroy our lives. And we can make excuses and we can make it about other people. But if each of us today, starting with me, would take accountability for my life, Satan, you have no place in my life. You've been evicted. I want more of your presence, more of your peace. No one looking around. You know, one of the major signs besides fear is also lack of peace. Literally, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. How do you become a prince? By having a dad that's a king. In other words, peace is his lineage. That's all he ever knew. And some of you are living a life of turmoil right now. You've made it your spouse, your kids, your job, your boss. Instead of saying it starts with me. Right? Let's just normalize being normal. Let's normalize being people of God. Let's normalize having good mental health. Let's make it who we are. Let's identify as followers of Jesus and let's live it out every single day with no one looking around. If you need to surrender your life to Jesus, maybe you have, but you need to re-dedicate -re your life back in there, sin in your life. 
You might even be a believer. God, if I've allowed some junk in my life, I'm just going to acknowledge today, enough's enough. Or you need to give your heart to him. You don't just give it to him. He wanted it first. And you need to repent and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. If that's you, would you just slip a hand up today? I see your hands. Yeah, that's great. All over the building. Beautiful. I got you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. All three of you up there. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. If you did say this, and we would love to walk with you in your faith, right in front of you is a QR code. They're on the screen. Talk to one of us pastors. We have an amazing group of people that would love to help you walk in your discipleship as a new believer. We'd love to walk with you. So can we just stand to our feet? We're going to call the prayer team forward today. And we're just going to pray. If you need a miracle, if you need God to move in your life, if you need prayer to forgiveness, if you need to just, I need to get prayer. This is a safe place. We'd love to pray with you, stand with you, and believe with you. Let me pray one more time. We're going to sing one more song. Prayer team's going to come forward. Let's have some boldness and respond. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to worship you today. Satan, we evict you from our homes, our families, our marriages, our kids, our minds. You have no right. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.